So we'll start with the, uh, the first case. Um, this is a uh, 38-year-old female with uh, five years of worsening axial back pain. Um, she works in a factory. Uh, she's recently been placed on restricted duty because of her pain. No trauma, no past surgical history. You can see from her film, she has a degenerative disc at L5S1. A CT scan demonstrates that she has a vacuum disc at 5'1". The axial CT scan demonstrates that there's no facet arthrosis posteriorly at 5'1". They look pretty pristine. And the MRI shows that uh, the rest of her levels look, look great. Um, she tried non-operative uh, techniques, physical therapy, uh, medial branch blocks. She didn't get any help with any of those. This is not a workman's comp case. Uh, she's not seeing anybody. She's just a woman that has uh, axial back pain. Uh, the two speakers that we have for this session are Paul Park and Jack Cleo. Paul's going to talk about um, an A-lift for this case. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Rock. I want to start off by thanking uh, Dallas, our acting program director, for inviting me to give this presentation. But I'll say, um, you know, when I first looked at this, I was like, my God, we got the worst, worst debate item. <laughs> you know, arguing against arthroplasty in a young woman. But I, I think I'm going to make a, hopefully a pretty good argument of why ALIP is the best option here. Um, hmm. Is this what you did? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I think <laughs> Rock's a believer. Okay. All done. Okay. So the right answer is, uh, yeah, can you close my presentation, please? Okay, a bit of my disclosure. Um, so I, I didn't actually get the case beforehand, um, but I, so I picked a random case, and I made some assumptions. Young patient, I didn't know what that meant. It could have been a 60-year-old young patient versus 50, 40, but 38 is very young. And I assumed symptoms were just low back pain. Okay? And here are two options, um, and ALIPS is probably going to be the best option. I'll, show you why, and I'll explain why. So um, when I first looked at, looked at this, I thought, well, the answer is obvious. Who's going to argue against arthroplasty in a 38-year-old, right? I mean, preserving spinal motion makes sense, right, for the average layperson. Why choose a segment that was naturally meant to move? And it's usually leads to other problems, like adjacent segment disease. We're all fearful of this as a complication. Although, if you look at the literature, you can get adjacent segment disease after a laminectomy. So it may just be a matter of tissue over time. But a, a valid argument, and the literature suggests arthroplasty is better. If you look at the multitude of publications, including six to seven randomized studies, arthroplasty seems at least equivalent to a fusion of fat better with decreased long-term complications, such as adjacent segment disease. Um, but if you go to Cochrane review, and Cochrane is very well known as essentially the gold standard when it comes to systemic reviews, because they're independent, they're not funded by industry, just government uh, funding or academic institutions. And so they reviewed arthroplasty. They looked at 40 publications, seven randomized trials, six of them with a fusion of the control group, okay? So they're the gold standard for systematic reviews. And what they found, and these are highlights, vast back pain was 5.2 millimeters out of 100 better than fusion. Um, and ODI was 4.2% better, all low quality of evidence. And when they looked at it even closely, both upper bounds of the confidence interval for vast back and ODI were below the predefined clinically relevant difference. So, so there essentially is no difference, okay? And these are highly selected patients. These are patients that were selected where arthroplasty would be better because for all these clinical trials showing uh, a potentially new treatment, it's set up in a, in a way that it'll show a benefit, right? The industry sponsors are spending millions of dollars the protocols are set up in a way, I've been involved in a lot of studies, bunch of studies that would benefit the treatment or the new treatment. So even with that, there's no clinically significant difference in outcome, even if, though it's set up that way. And uh, adjacent uh, segment disease really wasn't even looked at in these studies, regardless of what speakers have said in the past. It's not, not studied at all, so we don't know that if there's a difference. Um, this is just an article showing that industry-sponsored studies are always going to be positive, okay? And that's all the randomized studies with arthroplasty are all industry-sponsored. So um, besides these studies, let's look at utilization. This is what I would consider the test of time, okay? What I mean is if it's an effective treatment, it's going to be used. We, we're all in the business of making patients better. So if it's a treatment that works, we're going to use it, right? Tactical screws is a very good example. When it was introduced, everybody started using it, skyrocketed. X-Stop is another example that came and went. Uh, dynamic stabilization came and went. A lot of hype and then went away. 
utilization is the main difference. So if you look at this utilization over the years, you can see arthroplasty started off really strong, and then it fell off a cliff. Now, in recent years, it's kind of made a small resurgence, but really not utilized at all. And there are a number of reasons why this study uh, pointed that out. It has multiple contraindications. Again, it has to be a highly selected population. Poor bone quality, high PI bonding will preclude arthroplasty, among others. Poor insurance coverage, again, if it's an effective treatment, insurance tends to cover it over time. And arthroplasty has been around long enough that it should be covered if it's effective, right? Surgeons have concern for implant durability, long-term complications, sure, those are valid arguments. But what I really think is, is and this wasn't said in the article, maybe it's because arthroplasty is not so great, regardless of what you, know, you may hear in conferences. So Garden Hype Cycle, uh, this is using business uh, advertising, and um, I, I think it's representative of what uh, occurs with new technology or new ideas. You have a trigger, some sort of innovation trigger, and this, in this case it would be arthroplasty, okay? And then you have early uh, publicity, a lot of speakers talking about the new technology. It sounds great, uh, better than whatever we have. So a lot of high people are interested in doing the procedure. But what ends up happening is people do the procedure in a widespread manner, and they find it's not that effective. So it, it, this is where the trough of disillusionment occurs, where people realize it's not so great and stop using it. Okay? Then over time, when you have a technology that maybe gets refined, maybe people find that it, it, it is useful for a select population, so you have this slope of enlightenment or a plateau of productivity, right? And so arthroplasty is like this, but I think it's more on the red side here, where it's become a niche product. Maybe in the highly selected group, it's okay. And if you look at uh, these two curves, the utilization curve as well as this Gardner Hype cycle, you can see it's suspiciously similar. So where you arthroplasty started in utilization at the peak of uh, your inflated expectations, and it fell off a cliff. And now it's made a small resurgence because it's probably okay in a select number of patients, but really not applicable to the majority of our patients. So here's Chad. He's going to come up and talk to you about why arth um, arthroplasty is better. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure he's going to have a lot of articles, but his articles are all suspect, right? So I wouldn't believe it. And um, this is what he told me. He kind of likes gay lift himself, so I'm not entirely sure where he's coming from. And so, um, in summary, uh, there's been a lot of hype with arthroplasty. Hype is not objective evidence at all. Um, literature is suspect and should be interpreted as such. And it, it, it probably is effective for a select number, a very small number of patients, but ALF overall is best off in this case. Thanks, Chad. Our next speaker is uh, Jack Cleo, and he's going to be talking about lumbar disc arthroplasty. All right. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Locke and uh, LSRS and uh, especially the uh, ICL committee. Um, I think uh, a lot of pearls from uh, from Dr. Park's uh, talk. I would. Um, who, who's a trainee here? Are there any trainees? Okay. One, two years in practice. Okay. Great. So, um, if you before I get started on the on the arthroplasty uh, argument, I think. Uh, I would, here's what I would say is take these pearls home. Uh, number one, don't operate on back pain if you can, basically. If you want to operate on back pain, the, it's the case that, uh, that Dr. Patel has put forward. It's a young, uh, employed, non-work comp. That's why all of these things, every single word he said is, is important. And this is exactly what I would say most of us, not all of us follow. So it's, uh, if they're young, they got to be employed. Uh, they have to do six to 12 months. Uh, are established six to 12 months relationship with me and with they've invested in physical therapy, uh, decreased their BMI, etc. Not seeking uh, litigation on, and not on narcotics. And that leaves us with probably like three years that we're operating on back pain, at least in my practice. Uh, the second thing, second pearl I would say is do what you're comfortable with and do what works in your hands. So if multiple options work, then um, do, do what you're good at. Uh, the third thing, I would say don't jump on the hype. Again, this is from, from that curve that he showed. I would typically not jump on the hype unless I'm involved in a trial. So if I'm in a research, everybody knows that works with me. If, if we're in a research trial, we will jump on the hype because uh, for research. So I mean, my senior partner will always say, yeah, I'll do anything for research. And then uh, the fourth pearl I'm taking home is be careful what you post on social media. Having said this, um, if you have... If you have uh, end-stage uh, OA of your knee, you're not getting that picture on the, on the left. You're getting that on the right. Similarly, shoulder, um, you're getting an arthroplasty. So why should it be different in the spine? Um, we don't know. 
we, we don't know. We know that uh, it certainly hasn't picked up. Arthro plasty, especially lumbar, hasn't picked up like it has picked up in uh, in other joints in the body. However, there are clear advantages to arthroplasty, and um, one of them is uh, preserving motion, but importantly also is the disinfecting disease. We talked about it in the cervical, we talked about it in lumbar spine, and, and this is a real problem. It does occur after uh, laminectomy. It should occur because of, uh, you know, poor technique sometimes, maybe violating facet joints, etc. whether you're doing whatever procedure you're doing, but it is most common when you do a fusion. And uh, keep in mind also the silent killer that we talked about but, uh, you know, some, some of us subscribe to it, some, some not, is the SI joint is also the adjacent level. So we look, always, always looking at that proximal level in the lumbar spine, but we forget that um, more and more uh, that multiple studies have shown that um, a fusion and a longer fusion puts forces and greater forces in longer fusion at the SI joint level. And this is just one of those um, studies illustrating the biomechanics. As a matter of fact, there, there, there's a meta-analysis that was uh, recently published that shows but one in four, but 24% uh, rate of um, symptomatic degenerative joint disease at the, at the SI joint for, uh, for all comers in fusion. So, uh, for me to, uh, the, you know, when, I, when I want to learn something, I go to the literature and I respect Dr. Park's opinion. That's why I went to one of his studies that uh, shows what happens after fusion. And, um, and sure enough, increased visceral pressure, increased mobility, and uh, and uh, increased uh, facet loading leading to a disinfectant de degeneration. And, that, uh, and multiple studies have actually showed this in the literature uh, in the past. It is worse when you're doing a uh, cervical screw fixation. Uh, there are multiple theories why. Again, uh, doing work posteriorly destabilizes maybe the musculature, posterior musculature, maybe the facet joint. Maybe sometimes when you're um, exposing the spine at the rostral level, you can put a screw through the uh, facet joint if you're not careful. And that's why we always recommend, you know, I recommend to my trainees staying really lateral. And this is kind of, I, I would consider it a misplaced screw if you put it through the facet joint. So definitely anterior uh, offers um, or causes less disruption uh, to the rostral level. And this would be a reason for, uh, for a disinfectant degeneration. Now, the studies, um, there is not a, really, there's not entwined a single modality that's been, as, as heavily studied as um, arthroplasty. And you can argue, and uh, the argument will be well taken, that uh, all of these studies were funded, or most of these studies were funded by companies because uh, they're extremely costly and it's really almost quasi-impossible to run studies um, of, this, uh, of this nature that are not funded. However, the early uh, prodis L study, two-to-one randomization, these are, these are randomized patients. They were chosen to be ideal patients, no osteoporosis, young functional, etc., no work comp. And uh, it was first published in uh, 2007 in Spine. Showed the following. Improved ODI scores and uh, somewhat improved uh, VAS pain in, uh, in, in the arthroplastic group. But there was more satisfaction and they were able to maintain about 8 degrees of motion. And you'll see that 7 to 8 degrees of motion in multiple studies there. So it was found to be statistically, there is statistically uh, statistical improvement over the fusion level. Again, then we went to the five years, uh, five year results. Uh, had pretty good follow up, about 80 percent, just over 80 percent follow up. Again, showing also some superiority of the um, of the arthroplasty group in terms of uh, uh, narcotic, in terms of uh, motion level was preserved at, at five years. And uh, so you can argue that what happens at 10, 15 years. I mean, I've seen uh, some. My my group has has been involved in multiple studies. They were involved in this in this study in the Charité study. And sometimes you do see on cues that 20 years, they're doing great like fusion. But you will see also patients 20 years now out that uh, have retained their motion. Um, the, adjacent, uh, the adjacent level data, so you get, uh, so this was a paper just looking at the adjacent level data and um, looking at that same group of patients. And it was observed at, for, for the fusion patients, Almost 30% had adjacent level disease. For the arthroplasty, 9%. So about 3 to 1. Now, they then looked at the adjacent level uh, levels that had pristine discs. So zero uh, degenerative changes in the discs. And again, 24% in fusion, under 7% in the, in, in the arthroplasty group. Again, a 3 to 1 difference. So it appears that if you take all of those uh, uh, patients, about three times 
uh, most common to have adjacent disease in, uh, in fusion patients than, um, than in osteoplasty. Then, meta-analysis at five years uh, by Ziegler and, um, and group. Um, better, more likely to reach ODI in, uh, in the osteoplasty group, not much different than the pain group. However, there was a decrease in the risk of reoperation at the index level, and that's something that we see in the cervical spine as well in uh, lumbar disc patients. So to summarize, again, there is not another modality that can uh, as studied as uh, this osteoplasty. Uh, there are some downsides. Uh, technique is uh, complex. Uh, you know, I always uh, jokingly say that uh, for a fusion, you can put uh, just put the just put the puck in and put some uh, good bone graft in and it'll fuse. And osteoplasty is difficult, especially in lumbar. You have to uh, follow very very thorough technique. So it's not uh, something that. I would typically uh, recommend doing as your first uh, maybe several anterior lumbars. I don't want to put a number on it, but you probably want to do, I don't know, 20, 25 A-lifts. And when you start doing A-lifts, I would um, recommend that you get familiar and learn the technique for osteoplasty and start applying it for A-lifts before you put a disc in. So basically, the difference is you need to preserve the implant. You need to have a great visualization, so exposure is key. But you need to also be able to uh, achieve uh, work in the back of the, uh, in the posteriority that typically you don't do for a uh, which is uh, resecting the annulus, resecting the PLL. I mean, when, and when you get good at it, you will have full view of the, of the dura. You'll be able to visualize the L5 root as, as it goes on both sides, uh, because just like cervical osteoplasty, decompression has to be much more sterile. And uh, so uh, the data is out there. I would say um, um, now that we know that uh, Dr. Patel did, uh, I probably would have done osteoplasty uh, for, young, for those uh, young patients, unless typically insurance doesn't approve it. Is there any questions? Thank you all.